Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Monday, August 8th, 2016. Here are top stories. Tonight, Donald Trump details his plans to make America great again. And for starters, that means no more Obamacare. We are going to terminate Obamacare and replace it with something. Meanwhile, the mainstream media continues to pretend that there is nothing wrong with Hillary Clinton's health. That's been... Wow. Plus, Iran wants more money from Obama as they urge him to use his remaining time in office to return $2 billion in frozen Iranian assets. Show me the money. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Friday, we had a new jobs report from the government and everybody in the mainstream media and Wall Street said it looked pretty good. However, today, our guest on the radio show, Michael Snyder, pointed out how it's not as good as you may think. He said, why the jobs report is not nearly as strong as you're being told. Although there are 7.8 million Americans that are considered to be officially unemployed, reality is they're ignoring about 94% of the people who are unemployed. Here's how that works out. You have an adjusted number and you have an unadjusted number. You know, it was back in the Bill Clinton administration that they got pretty smart and said, we're going to not count people who have been out of work for a certain amount of time. We're going to redefine what unemployed means. But the people who are really looking at the economy, people like private analysts who are working for various corporations, really do understand what's going on. They know what the real numbers are. We're going to look at some other metrics that tell us that the economy is not doing as well as these phony numbers from the Obama administration. This is a Mitsubishi strategist, John Herman. He wrote a short note uh, right after the report. He said, job headlines overstates the strength of payrolls. He added that the unadjusted data shows a middling report that's nowhere as strong as the headline. And he added that the private payrolls unadjusted were only 85,000 higher in July versus the seasonally adjusted 217,000. In his view, the government applied a, quote, very benign seasonal adjustment factor upon private payrolls to transform a soft private payroll gain into a strong gain. In other words, not anything to be worried about. It's very benign when they go in and fudge the numbers and say they've got nearly three times as many new jobs as they did before because they do a seasonal adjustment. So they adjust the unemployment numbers for people that are no longer looking for work because they've been out a certain amount of time. And then they do a seasonal adjustment to make the number of new jobs look better. They point out in this article from Michael Snyder, over the past several years, since 2001, as a matter of fact, we have seen a very troubling trend. And if you look at this chart, what you'll see is the fact that we had the massive drop off in uh, jobs and that happened with the crash back in 2008, 2009. And you see that it has gradually come back, but only partially. And what he points out is that in every recession that we had before 2001, what would happen is you would not only get back to the level that you were before the recession, but usually you would go much higher than you had been before. It would actually recover and go beyond where it had been until the next time you had a uh, downturn. What we're seeing now is that as we have these recessions, we're only recovering about 30% of where we had been before. We're not even getting back to where we had been at that point. Another metric that shows us what's going on, of course, is the oil business. Now, we have seen uh, today talk that OPEC's current president says that the oil cartel will hold informal side meetings in late September. This is a report from New American. This is code, they say, for higher prices for crude oil so that those member states can pay for their welfare states without continuing to drain their currency reserves. Well, they hope they can do that. The reality is, is that demand is down. There's been a gas war, quite literally. I remember uh, back when I was a child, there used to be gas wars where uh, filling stations on various corners would one of them would drop their price and then the other one would drop theirs and they would see who could go the lowest. That's what we've been seeing on an international level. We have seen the Saudis and OPEC in general try to drive out the new means of domestic production here in America through fracking. And they're not winning. And what we've seen with a massive decline in the price, wholesale price of oil is because they have 
continued to produce at these higher levels, rather than cutting production, they continued to produce in the face of declining demand. Declining demand in oil tells us that the global economy is not doing well. Now they're saying that they're going, they've had enough essentially. They're throwing in the towel. And we saw this reported about a week or so ago from the Telegraph. They say Texas shale oil has fought Saudi Arabia to a standstill. Remember, it was only, I guess, about a year ago that we were talking about projections that they might get down to $40 a barrel, or they might get down to, then it became $20 a barrel. And it's like, well, how low can they go? They're, the Saudis said, we can take this down to 20 and we can hold it there until we shut down all the domestic shale oil production in the United States. But guess what happened? We've got this report from the Telegraph where a fracking executive says that they can go down, their costs can go down to $2 and a quarter per barrel pre-tax. Okay, so basically what they have done with shale oil is to fight the Saudis into capitulation. So now the Saudis are saying, well, we're now going to cut supply to see if we can get the price up. They've had enough. They've thrown in the, the towel, so to speak. <laughs> uh, we'll see what happens. But the bottom line is, is that we see from these metrics that we're not seeing a recovering economy here in America. We're not seeing a recovering economy globally. We have seen the stock market that has been stimulated artificially, and we've seen other things that are being done like rigged job reports because they don't want people to get a sense that the economy is not doing well. Are people that stupid? Can they not figure out what's really going on in the economy? Remember when Bill Clinton ran, they said it's the economy stupid. Focus on the economy. And we see that Donald Trump did that today very concisely and, and surgically. He went to a place where we have seen Democrat policies have their full fruition here in the United States. And that, of course, is Detroit, Michigan. It is a shell of its former self. It's one of the poorest areas in the country, having once been one of the richest areas in the country. And why is that? Two reasons. Democrat economic policies on the welfare state and an exportation of our manufacturing base abroad. And so Donald Trump went there to lay out his economic proposals. He went after his Democrat opponent on Monday, told Americans they can expect to see more devastating economic effects like Michigan's once bustling industrial metropolis if Hillary Clinton becomes president. He said the city of Detroit is the living, breathing example of my opponent's failed economic agenda. He said, Detroit tops a list of the most dangerous cities in terms of violent crime. These are the silenced victims whose stories are never told by Hillary Clinton, but the victims whose suffering is no less real or permanent. And here's the bottom line, folks. Why did it get this way besides a massive export of jobs, which she still supports? She and her vice presidential candidate, uh, Kane, support the continued export of our jobs through TPP through TTIP, the transatlantic, transpacific trade deals that they say. They're about far more than trade, but they will allow our country's economy to be managed by people abroad. But here's the bottom line that Donald Trump gets to. He said the one common feature of every Hillary Clinton idea is that it punishes you for working and for doing business in the United States. Every policy she has tilts the playing field toward other countries at our expense. And when we go back and we look at what's happening in the Texas shale oil business, when we look at what's happened to our coal business, why did the coal business shut down? We've talked many times about how you could have, a, there are completely clean coal burning plants that don't emit any carbon dioxide, if that's your concern. Quite frankly, I don't buy man-made global warming, but if you're concerned about that, that's not an issue. Nevertheless, Obama has decided that he will shut down the coal industry. He said when he was running the first time, yeah, you can build a coal plant, but it'll bankrupt you. And now he is bankrupting West Virginia and the other places who have ample supply of coal and other fossil fuels that could be used cleanly. The bottom line is if we are allowed to compete, America can come back. But we have a government that is our biggest obstacle to wealth. And so Trump proposed a plan. He said, we're not only going to make America great again, we're going to grow America again. And he has released a few things that uh, are interesting. But of course, the mainstream media doesn't cover that. What you'll see in most of these mainstream media reports, if you look at it, they'll say, well, Donald Trump said he's going to reduce some taxes. He's going to reduce the number of different income tax brackets. In other words, simplify the tax code in a number of ways. Give us tax credits for uh, child care and some other things. 
But let's talk about his bad week last week. Let's talk about the fight that he had with the Sharia lawyer, Khan. That's what they do in virtually every one of these stories. Uh, they'll briefly talk about what he has proposed financially, uh, the fact that he wants to uh, reduce and simplify the tax code. I would like to see the tax code just eliminated, but simplification and reduction is a good beginning. We might ask uh, uh, why the government would not allow us to get credits for the things that it says are so important that they have to provide them for us or force us to get them. See, that's the difference in the way Trump approaches this. We can see specificity in his proposals. Many Republican establishment people have criticized him. They say, look, he says he's going to repeal and replace Obamacare, but we need details. We have reported here at InfoWars many times about the details in Donald Trump's health care plan. He has a very detailed proposal on his site, and it's been there for about six or seven months. He has talked about what he wants to do, and basically, as a, re, uh, as a reinstatement of this, when he talks about the uh, proposal, he has a very detailed seven-point plan. And if you look at it, it's very much market-oriented and against mandates and against federal control. Instead of holding a gun to your head, what he'll do is give you an incentive with tax deductions, allow you to set up a health savings account, give competition a chance because we have a government that wants to talk about free trade, but they don't want to have free trade in America, competition in America on insurance rates. So they draw lines around the states and say, no, you can't have an insurance company that's in this state compete in another state. They create artificial barriers to trade because the rules were written by the crony capitalists. So when we look at his health care reform plan, which is very detailed and it's an economic issue for sure, here it is, repeal Obamacare. No person should be required to buy insurance, eliminate the individual mandate. Number two, modify existing law that inhibits the sale of health insurance across state lines. Number three, allow individuals to fully deduct their health insurance premiums. Incentivize it, in other words, and then give us the information to know who the low cost health care providers are. Provide price transparency, price information, so you can make that decision. Give you power as a consumer give you the freedom as a consumer, create a free market with competition, and then give you information about the price of healthcare providers. That's basically it. It's a free market approach. And so if you want to know the specificity about it, he hasn't talked about it a lot in his speeches, but it's there on his website. It's a very market oriented approach. Now, the other thing that we've been seeing uh, criticized for, of course, is the idea that his policies are somehow more militaristic than our own governments. He has spoken out, however, about the fact that we have created the hotspots that are now in the world, both in, with Russia and the Ukraine, as well as in Syria. Now, even the mainstream media is calling this a proxy war, what's happening in Syria. It's a proxy war, they say, between the United States and between Russia. Here's what antiwar.com says. They say US officials and analysts have been warning that Syria's civil war could quickly devolve into a proxy war between Russia and the United States. But to hear them talk lately, the proxy war has been going on for some time already, and they don't like America's chances. And they point out, so who are the sides on this proxy war? Okay, think about this. This is a proxy war, so that means that the US and Russia have forces that are fighting there rather than fighting each other. But it's truly a war between America and Russia being fought with these proxies. So who's our proxy? Okay, on the Russian side, they have Syria's president, the government that was already in existence. You know, like the government that we took down in Libya and then created uh, an arms bazaar for uh, Al Qaeda and others. Well, what's going on in Syria? They say the primary targets of Russia and Syria have been Al Qaeda's Al Nusra Front and ISIS. Okay, so those are the guys who are on our side: Al Qaeda, Al Nusra, and ISIS. Those are our proxies. On the other side. Russia has the dictator in Syria, not a good guy, but certainly not Al Qaeda or ISIS. They say in the very simplistic version, Assad is stronger and that would be bad. And so the CIA wants to send more missiles to rebels to change that. But in reality, they say, however, Assad's gains are coming predominantly against ISIS, meaning effectively the US sees ISIS's losses as America's losses in this proxy war, precisely. Because as we've pointed out many times, we are the ones who have been arming ISIS. We created ISIS, just like we created Al Qaeda by creating the Mujahideen in another proxy war in Afghanistan. 
Now, the New York Times itself calls it a proxy war. Their headline, military success in Syria gives Putin the upper hand in a U.S. proxy war. That's precisely what anti-war was talking, anti-war.com was talking about. We have a proxy war. Who is losing? ISIS is losing to Russia. So that's bad because ISIS are our guys, right? That's what they're pointing out here. They say the rebel offensive, and that's what they call it, the rebel offensive, was aided by powerful tank-destroying missiles supplied by the CIA and Saudi Arabia. And these are CIA-backed rebel forces, they say. CIA-backed rebel forces are, again, Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra, and ISIS. Those are the people that we're backing. Those are the people that the CIA is backing. They say, for the first time since Afghanistan in the 1980s, the Russian military for the past year has been in direct combat with rebel forces trained and supplied by the CIA. And again, that was the Mujahideen, which became Al-Qaeda. And we have a guy from the Woodrow Wilson Center saying Russia has won the proxy war, at least for now. Another person from the Obama administration says, well, it's actually Obama himself says, I'm not confident we can trust Russians or Vladimir Putin. Whenever we're trying to broker any kind of deal with an individual like that or a country like that, you have to go in there with some kind of skepticism. Well, that would be a good idea. Maybe he should apply that same logic when he is dealing with Iran. But no, he gives Iran everything that they want, even violating the law against the sanctions, also violating laws against money laundering, helping out an, a state that he himself has identified as a terrorist state. Finally, we see that ISIS has captured U.S. weapons and equipment in Afghanistan. Yet again, we see ISIS showing photographs of weapons that they have captured along with a soldier's ID. Meanwhile, the Pentagon says, nah didn't happen. That's the standard story that we see over and over again. Stay with us. We'll be right back. We're going to take a look at the Black Hat Conference. We've heard a lot of talk from Obama and France's President Hollande saying that Donald Trump is unfit. Of course, uh, they're talking about the fact they don't agree with him. But there's also questions about Hillary Clinton's fitness. Her fitness to be entrusted with national security uh, secrets has been demonstrated uh, <laughs> to not be there. Joining us now is Leanne McAdoo to talk about Hillary Clinton's physical unfitness. Right, well, David, that's absolutely correct. Now, we saw how the word racism was weaponized during President Obama's tenure. So now we're starting to see the word sexism being used to silence any critics of Hillary Clinton. And so we're seeing a lot of these stories rolling out to just support how this is the time of the female and we've got to stop sexual harassment in the workplace. All of this in an effort to just really bring to the fore these issues, you know, women's rights and things, just like we saw with the racial tensions that have been fomenting in the country. Well, yeah, and like, like we saw with Kazir Khan, you cannot criticize this guy you because cannot. he's a Muslim and he's a gold star family. And it's like, well, if he interjects himself into politics and he has something to say about this, and if we vet him, you know, we find out that he's an advocate for Sharia law. But you can't say that. <laughs> That's politically incorrect. And you can't criticize Hillary Clinton's policies or her criminal actions because she's a woman. Right, or you are, you are gonna be called out as the sexist that you are. So Obama comes out last week saying that Trump is unfit, he's woefully unprepared to be president. This is while he is there promoting Hillary Clinton, okay, who has been on the wrong side of everything, okay? She supported the Iraq war up until about 2014. She didn't listen to her policy advisors there on Libya. She flip-flopped on her gay marriage ruling just a couple years ago. She was a Goldwater girl during the civil rights mm -hmm. era. So she was on the wrong side of the civil rights movement, okay? Mm -hmm. So this is someone who has proven herself time and time again to be unfit, not to mention that she has put the national security at risk with her private server. More on that later. But now they're already starting to say, how dare you say that Hillary Clinton is physically unfit for the presidency? Uh, there was a photograph that surfaced over the weekend. This had been taken a few months back in, in mm -hmm. February or January, and uh, it was you know all over conservative media showing Hillary Clinton having to be helped up some stairs. And of course, this this should be putting Hillary Clinton's health at the at the front of the 2016 campaign, but people are saying that you're sexist if you're doing that. Uh, Cokie Roberts came out this weekend on ABC's This Week saying, you know, Trump calling her unhinged is just code word for we shouldn't elect a woman. So they're already saying <laughs> like, you can't even question her mental fitness or her physical fitness, but it's not sexist. Let's look back to so They make the same statements about Donald Trump. They question right. his political fitness, his uh, mental fitness to be in office, but it's okay. 
uh, because of partisan politics is it, really what's going on. There's actually a petition going around demanding that Trump undergo a mental health test. And, hmm. you know, so you have these uh, media outlets kind of jokingly saying, well, we're going to go ahead and support this petition. So they, they want Trump to undergo mental health fitness, but not someone who has proven herself to have to flip flop on so many major things that have completely devastated the Middle East mm -hmm. for one. But back in uh, 2008, they were questioning John McCain's health, okay? So in May of 2008, John McCain's doctors give him a clean bill of health. But Months later, every month after that, McCain's age and past health problems could be an issue in the presidential race. McCain faces questions on age, health. Questions linger about McCain's prognosis after skin cancer. So he was diagnosed with skin cancer, which if you're <laughs> going to have a skin can a cancer, you might as well get skin cancer. It's yeah, it's not going to affect your judgment anyway whatsoever. Yeah. Not like a massive strike Blood on the head. Clot, okay, <laughs> so he had gotten skin cancer in 2000. Right. of which they cut it out, he was fine, you know, good for him, it wasn't recurring. But this is now eight years later, mm -hmm. and they're using that against him. Hillary Clinton had a fall in 2012, where she got a massive blood clot on her brain. She is taking Coumadin, a blood thinner, to this day, mm -hmm. which you shouldn't really have to do that. I mean, that, that just shows that she is a high-risk patient mm -hmm. if she's consistently on this blood thinner every single day of her life for something. That, so this was just about four years ago. Maybe and another not, reason why she wears the chairman mouth suits because that <laughs> yes. can also cause you to bruise very easily. It's a very telltale thing. I know because my dad had to take Coumadin after some blood clot issues and he would bleed very profusely if he was ever cut or nicked even with anything. And he had uh, massive bruises on his arms usually because he kept working. Wow. <laughs> So, that is yeah. a very interesting conspiracy theory. So you mean it's, <laughs> she's not just dressing for the job she wants? Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, that or it's the grampers <laughs> that she's wearing. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> don't well, know, and, and this is, you know, the same outfit that she was going to blame on that really long bathroom break that she took during the debate. <laughs> you know, women take longer to use the bathroom or whatever, but I guess it's just all the buttons that she's got to do on that Chairman <laughs> Mao suit. But of course, people are saying, no, there was some underlying health issues. She gets very dizzy when she gives a long speech. But CNN bashes these as conspiratorial questions about her health. So it's okay to ask about people's health when they're of a certain age and yeah. they're going to be put into the most powerful position on the planet. But and not these are two of the oldest Clinton. people that we will have elected to the presidency. Exactly. Okay? They're essentially the same age as Reagan. Yeah, she's only two years younger than John McCain was when mm -hmm. he was being questioned about his health and, mm -hmm. and you know, will he make it through his first term? So CNN is attempting to dismiss these questions, asserting that these photos show her uh, being helped up the stairs, um, that she was just struggling because she had just slipped and fell. And then, so this is CNN's Brian Selter saying, you know, that how dare Dr Judd, Dr Matt Drudge do this? He's taking this photo out of context. But he doesn't go on to explain how someone slipping as they're walking up the stairs could be evidence of them having an issue walking. I remember when they did this with Gerald Ford. I remember when Saturday Night Live did it. I, they totally destroyed the man because he slipped on some plain steps at the time and because of a golf a golfing accident. And so you had National Lampoon and these uh, Mad Magazine, they had him sticking an ice cream cone on his forehead. I mean, everybody was making fun of him, and they laughed the man out of existence. Not that I'm a Gerald Ford supporter, but <laughs> that was the way the Democrats came after Gerald Ford and the comedians who are part of the Democrat establishment. Right, and we can't even ask these very serious questions. People say, well, why does it matter about her health? When you have to make decisions with your brain it really matters if you have blood clots on your brain or a physical impairment that causes you to be dizzy, uh, to, to feel faint, to have uncontrolled facial um, seizures there. And, you know, people just are pushing this to the side saying, you know, we need our first woman president. But CNN fails to point out how we have um, really high level federal agents saying that no, they have plenty of people that have worked on her team saying it's not just the fact that she has issues walking and she needs help, uh, but she also has to sit down and rest a while after she gives a speech. She gets very dizzy, very fatigued to the point where she gets very pale, sweaty, disoriented. We know Huma, uh, her aide there in the email said that Hillary is often confused, so you have to explain things to her yeah. over and over yeah, again. That was amazing. So yeah. Let's make her the most powerful woman. Um, Who's often confused. Yes, she's often confused. She doesn't know how to use uh, technology, so she sets up this private server. And we just had these two uh, meltdowns at the end of the week where uh, she referred, said she's going to raise taxes on the middle class, referred to Donald Trump as her husband, that, that type of thing. Even yeah. though everything that she does is carefully scripted and telepromptered for her, she doesn't speak off the cuff like 
Donald Trump does. He'll go in and speak for an hour and a half. I mean, incredibly long time, just off the top of his head. Uh, and and a lot of people said, well, you know, he, he needs to focus on the issues he wants to talk about. But they're not talking about how he can't manage to conduct a conversation over that period of time. Right. And they, and they want to just pick apart certain things, saying he's mentally unfit, not pointing out the fact that he is a wildly successful entrepreneur, billionaire. So how do you do that if you're mentally unfit? It just doesn't make a lot of sense. Of course, we've seen Hillary Clinton's coughing fits, which is a side effect of a lot of the drugs that she's taking, Coumadin, the antihistamine. These are things that a lot of people report having a dry cough. And the older you get, the more susceptible you are to this side effect of this dry cough. And uh, John Rappaport points out that, A, this is a rat poison, okay, warfare. And so we're <laughs> going to elect someone who's basically taking rat poison every single day. It can be totally lethal, giving you, yeah, you know, destroying dangerous. your liver. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But Martin Shkreli, I don't know if you remember him. He was kind of the most hated man on the Internet for a while. He was the uh, pharmaceutical exec that raised the price of uh, an, an HIV drug about 1,000% right. overnight. Mm -hmm. Well, he came out. He's actually created... Uh, a drug for one of the symptoms, the freezing gait that Hillary Clinton seems to exhibit. And so he came out saying, you know, I've got a 15 year background in drug discovery and pharmaceuticals, and she has pretty unmistakable signs of Parkinson's disease, um, and that a stroke or concussion would not explain the symptoms of freezing gait, as well as um, her making those perplexed facial movements. That is a Parkinson's induced dyskinesia. So it's a classic symptom. So this is, you know, someone in the industry coming out and putting it on the line, saying that these are the symptoms that he would say it. Very interesting because, you know, all this stuff about just be quiet. She's going to be the first woman president. And the, if she has major health issues, it's going to be Kane who's going to wind up being the president. Exactly. So you're not going to get a, a woman in that job. Now stay with us when we come back. We're going to take a look at some of the things that were revealed at the hacking conference in Las Vegas. You'll be amazed what they can do to you. We'll be right back. The United States is being handed over to the United Nations. Obama recently announced that he will bypass Congress and seek a United Nations Security Council resolution to outsource the United States nuclear policy to an international body. The Daily Caller reports the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action does not require congressional approval, but likely binds future U.S. government policy towards Iran. Obama's U.S. Attorney General Loretta Lynch wants to federalize the nation's police with the United Nations-backed Strong Cities Network. In 1999, Lynch was appointed by Bill Clinton to head the U.S. Attorney's Office in New York. And by 2002, according to Lynch's bio, she joined Hogan & Hartson LLP, now Hogan Lovells, as a partner in the firm's New York office. While in private practice, Ms. Lynch performed extensive pro bono work for the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, established to prosecute those responsible for human rights violations in the 1994 genocide in that country. Human rights violations, where between 500,000 and 1 million Rwandans were killed by their own countrymen. Bill Clinton later apologized for standing by silently and doing nothing. It is my hope that through this trip in every corner of the world, today and tomorrow, their story will be told. That four years ago in this beautiful, green, lovely land, a clear and conscious decision was made by those then in power that the peoples of this country would not live side by side in peace. During the 90 days that began on April 6th in 1994, Rwanda experienced the most intensive slaughter in this blood-filled century we are about to leave. We talk about Rwanda as a failure of U.S. policy, a failure to intervene, a failure to recognize what was going on, and a failure to take action to stop genocide. But if you look at the Clinton administration's approach to it throughout the entire period, what you really see is that it was actually a success of a policy not to intervene. It wasn't a failure to act. The decision was not to act. And at that, we succeeded greatly. The same company, Hogan Lovells, employed gold star father and recent Trump annoyance, Kazir Khan. Lynch and Khan come from the Clinton Foundation stable of attorneys tied to Saudi Arabia, the Muslim Brotherhood, and a who's who of foreign dictators. Be forewarned, America, the Clintons and any of their lackeys will seek to hijack any and all crises for their own benefit. And with Saudi Arabia reportedly funding 20% of Hillary's campaign, it is vitally important to the aforementioned and 
other Clinton plants that Sharia law circumvent the U.S. Constitution. I mean, we're talking about a woman who exclusively used a private server to trade our deepest, darkest secrets, knew the thing was hacked. And still used it anyway. And was and getting money. Accurately stated. Yeah, she was doing it on purpose, right, probably story, probably to sell them. I mean, I, I think your Secret Service guy, I think you're catching on to what I've been told. Hillary knew it was hacked. This was her plausible deniability to sell secrets right there for money to come back to the foundation. Well, I don't know, but I know the Clinton Foundation, I write this in the book too, is kind of like a shadow government. What they're trying to do with the Clinton Foundation is they're influence peddling. They're trying to get their people into these appointed special positions in the government. They're then selling influence through the Clinton Foundation for people who will then be able to, they'll be able to go back and contact those folks within the government and get things done and expedite them on kind of a governing, uh, you know, HOV lane. So their people get service you don't. Again, if you have any doubt you're being ruled, not governed, just look at the Clinton Clinton Foundation and how their friends get expedited service. And this is the ultimate, the, the ultimate the DMV. discrimination. I mean, against all Americans to have a second class, you know, for the general public and this elite class above the law, it's the essence of tyranny. And with the recent arrest of a DC Metro officer assisting ISIS, alarm bells should be ringing as to the scale of the infiltration by a radical jihadist network operating at all levels of our government. John Bound for Infowars.com. Now, Paul Nealon is a Wisconsin executive, entrepreneur, and inventor. He has extensive leadership and operational experience in manufacturing industry, but we need more lawyers, as well as a record of restoring jobs in the American economy. Mr. Nealon is challenging the Speaker of the United States Representatives, uh, that's uh, Paul Ryan, uh, in Wisconsin's first congressional district Republican primary election, August 9th. So that's coming up here. Uh, boom, tomorrow, Mr. Nealon serves as senior vice president of operations for his company that leads the industry in water filtration. We were just talking about that. And d uh, disinfection technologies, or civilization, I would say. Since 2013, Mr. Nealon has served as an advisory board member of Operation Homefront, a Wisconsin nonprofit organization with strong record of bringing direct financial assistance to the families of active duty service members. Paul Nealon, N-E-H-L-E-N.com. Everybody should get behind him uh, just to put more heat. We already brought down the rhino, um, you know, who, of course, was installed by Newt Gingrich. And uh, that was the former speaker, Boehner, or, or Crybaby. And then now we have Paul Ryan, who I guess is a handsome guy, you know, Mr. Blue Eyes. But, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of people, well, I mean, I, I know Paul Nealon's story is interesting. I don't want to get it wrong. I remember hearing about it. The reason he started running against him was he was tired of being betrayed. Is that is that accurate, Mr. Nealon? That's absolutely accurate. Thanks for having me on, Alex. Um, you know, I, I, I believed Paul Ryan's shtick. He absolutely is, uh, he's the head of the snake. Let's, let's, no mistake, let's make no mistake about it. He absolutely is the most open borders, anti-worker, pro-Wall Street member of Congress on either side of the aisle. And he is the head of the snake, and we're going to take him off. We are going to cut the head off the snake because he absolutely has no moral qualms at all about shipping our jobs over to China. He, he is completely beholden to Wall Street, and we just don't pay well enough here in Wisconsin's district, first district. He gets paid a lot better by uh, big foreign, big corporations, not foreign, excuse me, big corporations that do the bidding of maybe a thousand families in this country that, that enrich themselves over the destruction of America. Sure. Well, they fence the money too, but a lot of the money is foreign. Look at Hillary's, look at Hillary's foundation. Uh, get, I mean, get back to yourself and why you decided to go after this guy, because, you know, they, they've been selling him for a decade on conservative talk radio as this little angel of conservatism. But when you get into his actual votes, He's the opposite of that. Exactly right. I, I, I'll, I'll out myself and say, hey, I was a Paul Ryan supporter until he came out as the mercenary champion of Fast Track Trade Promotion Authority uh, for this Trans-Pacific Partnership. And when I read that, I read what Senator Sessions, uh, God bless him, went out and, and reported on it. Alex, you know how I had to go to the New Zealand government website. I had to go to the New Zealand website because our own government had that information hidden from us. And you know what? I found out that everything that Senator Sessions reported on was absolutely true. 
by going to the New Zealand website, Article 27 of TPP gives up U.S. sovereignty. It reduces the length of U.S. patents. I just got my fifth U.S. patent three weeks ago tomorrow. It gives, it gives H-1Bs and H-2Bs. We won't even be talking about H-1Bs and H-2Bs because foreign companies will be able to bring all the workers they want to this United States. It won't even be the United States anymore. It'll be the United States of Asia. Paul Ryan is the globalist, soulless globalist head of the snake. And that's why tomorrow we're going to cut the head of that snake off. We're absolutely going to have Wisconsin's Independence Day tomorrow because we are sick to death of his lies and his deceit and his working on behalf of corporations. He could care less about us here in Wisconsin workers. He could care less about Puerto Ricans. And yet he pushed through the Puerto Rico hedge fund bailout. He could care less about Wisconsin's pensioners, which way were sold those junk bonds invested in Puerto Rico. But his hedge fund managers, oh, he loves them. He loves them because they put money in his campaign coffers and he has got visions of running in 2020. That's why he wants to stab Mr. Trump in the back at every opportunity. He doesn't want to see him succeed. I've said this before. Paul Ryan should be reporting in-kind contributions to Hillary Clinton's campaign because he's working on her behalf as opposed to working on behalf of Donald Trump. Well, I like in your race and others, win, lose, or draw is patriotic duty. And I appreciate your time and energy to do this because you know, I remember you talking about how when you first started running, how, how, how folks have been betrayed by him. Uh, remember Eric Cantor. Now, now, he was way ahead in the polls on election day. He lost. We've learned these polls, especially in key races, trying to prop folks up, are absolutely staged. Well, it's August, and that means that it's time for the hacker conferences in Vegas, the annual Black Hat as well as DEF CON. We have uh, both White Hat and Black Hat hackers gathered together to look at system vulnerabilities. And, of course, they had a fundraiser for Hillary Clinton. Pretty unprecedented for them to do that. And yet, she really does, I think, represent job security to these people. She is the poster child for security vulnerability, isn't she? All you have to do is say, look at Hillary Clinton. You know, look at what happened to her. Don't you want to protect your data? We're going to look at some of the things that they've uncovered. But before we do, I just want to go back and remind you of what happened with President-elect Obama in 2008. He'd won the election. He was waiting to be sworn in the beginning of 2009. And if you remember, there was a lot of talk at the time about how he had to surrender his smartphone. They had a specially prepared BlackBerry, which he didn't like, that had been prepared by the NSA. They'd stripped out a lot of functionality to make it secure. Isn't it interesting that as there were all these stories, and this went on, if you remember, for about a week or two, all these stories about how Obama had to surrender his smartphone because of vulnerabilities at the very same time, Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State, chosen by Barack Obama, was setting up her network of private unsecured servers, where we now know she handled, sent, and received the highest level classification above top secret in an unsecured way. So when we look at the support of these hackers, it really does have to be job security that they're looking at. But let's take a look at some of the things that they unveiled here. Wired Magazine reports the radio hack that can steal your keystrokes, and it works on millions of wireless keyboards. Now, understand, we've pointed out in the past that you're vulnerable with your camera that's on your monitor, with the microphone that's there to record you. We were called conspiracy theorists and everything. But now you can see pictures of Facebook's Zuckerberg with tape over his monitor, just like Alex Jones was doing 10, 15 years ago, warning people that that was possible. And of course, now when we look at them stealing keystrokes from you, this has been demonstrated with wireless keyboards who you understand, uh, those are communicating with the computer via a kind of a radio setup. So that's something that's fairly easily intercepted. But now they can also go in and type using that. They can not only see what you're typing, but they can make your computer type stuff that you aren't typing to set you up or other things like that. Because we have to understand, that the real sinister actors here are coming from various governments, including our own, going after people that they don't like. This is not anything new. 35 years ago, when I was working as an engineer, 
they had the capability to look at wired keyboards. Keyboards that were connected with a wire, not broadcasting the signals in a two-way radio setup, but wired to the computer. They could tell and they could monitor outside of the room. You had state actors who were able to do this. Any monitor, any wired keyboard could be monitored. They could, understand, they could look at it and see what you were typing. And this could be done by people who were outside of the building. They had tempesting programs, which are basically uh, testing programs that you had to go through, certify the hardware to make sure that could not be done. And that was a, a vital part of getting most of the federal contracts at the time. But now we just put stuff on Hillary Clinton's private servers. And now it is supposedly news that an unsecured, unencrypted radio device can do this as well. And I guess the thing that surprised these people who found the hack, they said that uh, they were had no expectation that in 2016, companies would be selling keyboards without any encryption. Ah, but it gets worse than that. Take a look at the latest hack against a Jeep. And this is reported by ABC News. They say Jeep hackers are back at Black Hat with new and scarier methods. This is a pair of well-known hackers uh, that we reported on uh, last year. Now they found a way to take control of a Jeep Cherokee, but do it while it is moving at high speed. Uh, these two grabbed headlines last year showing how they could kill a Jeep's engine while it was traveling down a highway, and it prompted a recall of 1.4 million Jeeps and other vehicles by Fiat Chrysler. But now they say they can uh, take over the vehicle while it is going down a road at speed. They're able to make the vehicle unintentionally speed up, or they can remotely slam on its brakes. They say, if you can steer a car at any speed, that's pretty dangerous. That's right, it is. Just ask Michael Hastings about that. Remember when we told you about that? Just like the tape over the cameras uh, and the fact that they're listening to you in the, in the room with the computer, which I now freely admit as well. We told you at the time that happened with Michael Hastings. Look, they have the capability to do this. And of course, we were called conspiracy theorists. So they said we were paranoid about it. And they go on to say that uh, Chrysler says that's not anything to worry about. Uh, we don't think that most people are going to be trying to do this. So they're just not going to make it secure because they don't think most people will be willing to do that. Look, here's the issue. Not only can the government assassinate people and make it look like an accident, any individual could do that to somebody else as well. It's very easy to do it. But it's not just hacking. Understand that with these systems, as complicated as they are, a software bug. A software failure could do the same thing that a malevolent hacker would do. Take a look at Tesla's Model S. This is another hack that they did, uh, this time to Tesla's Model S autopilot. Researchers have used off-the-shelf tools to trick the autopilot sensors on a Tesla Model S, demonstrating that it is simple to blind the car so that it doesn't see obstacles in the path. You know, kind of like a white truck that pulls in front of you when you're going nine miles over the speed limit and you've entrusted it all to the car to drive you through and it doesn't see it at all. Look, we've also seen a startling admission from Google when they took out the patent for their Google self-driving cars. They took out a patent and said, we're going to work on a device that can recognize turn signals and brake lights because they don't currently do that. But understand the mode of vulnerability here on the Tesla Model S. They say it's not time to worry about rampant carnage, though, says Tesla and the researchers, because we won't see any crashes caused by signal tampering anytime soon. Okay, fine. If you believe that, uh, then just get in your car and turn the driving over to it. Now, they point out that this is very easily done because the autopilot relies on millimeter wave radar, ultrasonic sensors, and forward-looking cameras, all of which measure echoes of signals that are reflected back by the obstacles. And consider how complicated this system is. Jamming attacks can prevent ultrasonic sensors from detecting objects. Okay, spoofing attacks can manipulate the sensor measurements and so forth and so on. You can even have acoustic cancellations. What will happen when they update your software for your car, like they update the software for your phone? This is one of the reasons why I think that you're not seeing uh, Tesla doing well in the stock market, even though the stocks it's, themselves have gone up by a factor of 12 in 13 years, Tesla has only had one single quarter in which they have turned a profit. That's 0.2% of the time. You can always make money on Wall Street if you operate on the principle of the greater fool. And that's what we see happening here. Uh, they have not been able to uh, ship the devices that they uh, thought they would be able to. We have seen that uh, 
an investigation of this fatal accident. They came out and said, no, it wasn't on autopilot. Well, the investigation says, yes, it was, in fact, on autopilot. And even though Tesla says they have controls to keep the cars from going more than five miles over the speed limit, uh, it was going nine miles per hour over the speed limit. And so how does Elon Musk and Tesla keep going when they have lost money every single quarter except one of the 13 years they've been in operation? Of course, as Eric Peters has pointed out, we've carried the story at InfoWars.com. He is the crony capitalist king. He says if Elon Musk's various projects are so Iron Man fabulous, why do they all need so much government help? Shouldn't Tesla, Solar City, and SpaceX, all his companies, be able to stand on their own merit if they actually have merit? Remember that they got $1.3 billion in crony capitalist incentives from the state of Nevada. They also got $15 million from the state of California, you know, because they're going to provide jobs. Oh, really? Is that what they're going to do? Understand altogether, and LA Times has reported on this as well, his ventures have gotten about $5 billion worth of subsidy from the government. Is he creating jobs with this? Look at this story from the Washington Post. Tesla's Model 3 factory could feel and look like an alien warship. In other words, absolutely no humans, which means absolutely no jobs are being created there. And they say, well, for decades, we've seen a trend in manufacturing where they put robots on the floor to help people. But Elon Musk wants to turn this into a whole new level with a factory that produces the upcoming low-cost Model 3, a machine that makes a machine, and he says it looks like an alien dreadnought. That's what he told investors on a conference call last Wednesday. He said it will look, that's what it'll look like once it is fully developed in about five years. He says its visage will likely inspire something between wonder and terror. He said the machine will ultimately be so complex that no humans will be expected to operate it directly or to participate in the actual building of each Model 3. That's what your $5 billion of subsidy for job creation to this crony capitalist buys you. Well, that's it for tonight's nightly news. Join us again tomorrow night at 7 Central, 8 p.m. Eastern.